Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy with a warning. Don't look now, but there's something crawling in your kitchen sink. Here is the captain. Yeah, it's hairy, scary, and long. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. We still have some Hair Razor in the old garage fridge. Hair Razor is a double IPA from the good folks over at Exhibit A Brewing in Framingham, Massachusetts. Hair Razor features plenty of hops, starting with a good batch of Galaxy hops and smoothed out quite nicely by delicious flavors of tropical fruit. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And let's give some cheers to our friends for helping us fill up the old garage fridge. First up, a big We Like Your Jib goes out to Charlie from Santiago, California. And last but certainly not least, we have a long distance cheers to Patty in Worthing, UK. Everyone we mentioned, they went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer fund. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, beer run. If you would like to get your earballs spanked, sign up for our bonus content through Patreon or the Apple Podcast app, or if you would like to listen to any of the first edition of Off the Record, do so by following us on YouTube's, on the YouTube's, all the kids are doing it. And that's enough of the biz. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. It is believed that September 2nd, Friday, 1977, just after work, is the last sighting of Simone Ridinger. She was 17 years old, and she's been missing ever since. She worked her shift that day at the Rainbow Restaurant in Natick, Massachusetts. She was supposed to be heading out to Chappaquitta to a cottage that her family owned to join them for the long weekend, if not longer. For many years... The Rainbow Restaurant was believed to be the last place that anyone reported seeing Simone. But in 1986, a witness came forward who said that, no, he gave Simone a ride. And he had a very different story to tell. Now, this man doesn't just walk into the police station and give this information willy-nilly. No, what happened was, we talked about yesterday how the Sherborne Police Department over the years continued to go to the media to channel the public to get information in Simone's case. 
So what takes place here in 1986, Captain, is that they had just did a story in the newspaper that came out the day before. So this man walks into the police department and says, I have some information for you. Right. That I actually gave this young woman a ride. And what prompted him to come into the police department was he saying, look, I, I didn't, I was unaware that this was a case, that this was something that was of importance until I read the newspaper article yesterday in my paper. And so I am here to give you some information. Now, what's really interesting about this. Okay. So this is a, there, there's some weird things here. Yeah. Let's get into it. Let's Be, get weird. Yeah. We're going to get very weird because what happens here is this, this is like a tight rope moment, I believe in this case. So you got to walk this fine line and there are things that could tip you to the side of disbelieving everything this man says or tip you to the other side where you fall and then believe that this is true, that this really took place and this is good information in the case. So the short version of it is this witness was an elderly man who unfortunately, like several other persons that we've discussed in this case, is now deceased. So we can't go back and interview him again. But in 1986, he's saying that he was in, he came into the police department saying that he was in route in 1977. He's in route to go out to the Cape. He says that he's pulled over near or at a rest area. Right. This is on route 128 and route 109 in Westwood, Massachusetts. He believes that he's pulled over by a state trooper. And the state trooper, during the interaction with this elderly man, says, hey, I got this girl that's going out to Martha's Vineyard, to Cape Cod. According to the man, this girl was in the backseat of the trooper's car. And he says, look, could you give her a ride the rest of the way? To which this older gentleman says, sure, no problem. So he says that he this girl gets in his car. They, they talk quite a bit while they're traveling together. A lot of chit chat. They, they figure out that they're roughly from about the same area. They don't know each other prior to this ride, but this witness says that he dropped Simone, the person he believes to be Simone riding her, that he drops her off at Hyannis near the airport saying that he last saw her walking towards a nearby restaurant uh, there were two restaurants in that area at the time, one a Howard Johnson's and two a Ground Round. Both tasty treats. The problem here, though, is, Captain, this witness's account has not been confirmed. I right? got a couple questions, though, right? He's coming forward nine years later. It's a long time. And so he would have been 79 at the time that he came to the police department and he would have been 70 at the time that he gave this young person a ride. If in fact he did. Right. So many questions. One, did law enforcement pick up hitchhikers? Like I don't, I didn't know if that's a thing. I mean, I know sometimes I've known local police officers that have like seen somebody that like, walks to work at the at the local Wendy's and they might go, hey, I'm heading that way. You want me to give you a ride? But for for a state trooper just to pick, pick up a hitchhiker, she's young and she's attractive, so I guess there's a possibility. So that's confusing, but it's also confusing to me. Why would the trooper put this 17-year-old basically into the care, into the custody of this elderly man that he's pulling over. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it, it doesn't make sense. The, the thing here is I know I gave out a couple different uh, routes and whatnot, but, but primarily this would be 95 that this man would have been traveling on. And what's interesting though is, again, he would have lived only a handful of miles away from where Simone Reidinger lived. So it's not out of the question that he would be traveling in the same direction because we know he's going to roughly the same general location that she intends to go to. However, 
they're they're not going s- close enough to one another that, that that she would ride with him for the entirety. She needs to get off at some point and go her own way. So that makes some sense. in what is his purpose for his travels? Apparently, he's a, a has a hobby of working and in, in restoring clocks. Yeah. And so he was traveling out there to pick up some parts, some clock parts. And says that, you know, this, I got pulled over and then I wasn't looking to pick up a hitchhiker, but the officer asked me if I would drive this girl closer to where I was headed. And I said, sure, no problem. Now back to what you're talking about here, Captain, it's, I think it's actually very common, not for an officer to hand a civilian over to another civilian, but I would think that it's rather common that if a police officer, especially a state trooper, somebody that's primarily working the freeways and the highways in most jurisdictions, in most States, it's illegal for pedestrians to be walking near the freeways and the highways. Right. And so those persons are going to get picked up. They're likely not going to get charged with anything depending on, how nice or not nice your officer is, you might get a ticket. But I would believe that if she, let's pretend that she did hitchhike and made her way somewhat to her destination, right? At some point, maybe it's it's fair to make the assumption that maybe she traveled a distance and got dropped off by another ride that she hitched. And maybe an officer spotted her walking and says, eh, this can't happen. I got to get her off of the the freeway here travels some distance, gets to talking to this old man and says, Oh, you know, she's not done anything wrong. Maybe this old guy didn't really do anything wrong. Hey, you're both going the same way. He's an old dude. Maybe uh, he seems well enough and good enough. Maybe I'll, I'll hand her off. The problem becomes Sherborne police cannot find any record of an officer picking up Simone writing her or picking up a pedestrian cannot find any, report of the traffic stop because that's the part of his story that what happened to that traffic stop he says he was pulled over he's not pulled over to give this girl a ride the officer wouldn't know where this guy's going no he's pulled over for some kind of violation now is it hey you know your your tail lights out but it, hey if you do me a solid and take this girl down the road a little bit for me uh we can just forget about it so i want to know what happened to that traffic violation the other thing but here's the thing like as unbelievable as this story seems he gives a description of the person that he tells police now he i don't believe at any time does he ever say she told me her name was simone she told me her name was simone writing her right i don't think that that's what happened when he reports this but the thing that you can that makes it so you cannot completely dismiss this as a possibility is the description of the clothes. So he gives the description of the clothes saying that she was wearing blue jeans with rips and patches, a white t-shirt, sneakers, and she was carrying a gray duffel bag. Well, yeah. what's interesting about him giving this description in 1986, the police don't have this description yet. Forget about the media or the public. That clothing description's not been released to anybody and never was released once they get this information from the old man. They don't release this description until after talking to those two waitresses years later. Yeah, and when new detectives come on this case, obviously they'd love to talk to this individual because he's the last known person to see her alive. So he becomes a suspect in a way, but... I don't think this guy had any criminal history. I don't think, I mean, again, a a very simple hobby of he liked to work and fix clocks. But he's not alive, but they're able to talk to his son. And I I don't know, and this is kind of a heads or tails type thing. The detective finds it a little suspicious that the, the father never told the son about this. And that is one thing when, when I spoke with some of the officers that have worked this case over the years, one, a piece of the puzzle that I was unaware of then and still unaware of to this date. And so 
as you said, a bit of a head scratcher. I want to know the details of choosing those words in that statement. Okay. What, what exactly does that mean? Does, does that mean that father never tells son, Oh, I picked up this girl and, and gave her a ride. I got pulled over by the police and you'll never, they asked me to give this girl a ride and I dropped her off. Okay. I can get that. Maybe dad doesn't tell son that. Right. Fast forward to 1986. How in the hell does somebody not tell? And maybe, maybe they're not close. I don't know. But I would think that if I read a newspaper article on a Tuesday, let's say, and Wednesday morning, I'm in, at the police station giving a report of something that happened to me nine years prior. I think that's something I'm telling people. Well, because it's such a abnormal activity. Yes. It's not like, oh, well, you know, I went to the dentist the other day. It's like, or, hey, I had to go pick up lumber at the lumber yard or I whatever. This is a, I was reading a newspaper report and they started talking about this missing girl that I believe I gave a ride to. I believe I might be the last person that saw her alive. Yes. So she's been missing for almost 10 years. Yeah. You show up for a cup of coffee or church on Sunday, bump into an old friend or you're hanging out with your son. Now keep in mind, he's 79 years old, roughly Yeah. in 1986. So his son's a grown man. But yeah, you when there's no way that you're going, hey, what you been up to lately? Oh, you don't go same old, same old after you've had that experience. Well, but you go, no, I read a newspaper article of a missing person who they believe has been likely murdered. I figured out that day that I might have been a witness to something or have important information in this case from nine years ago and I was sitting at the police station telling them everything I knew the following day. Yeah. And I think we both agree. It makes more sense for him to tell his son, but we don't know their relationship. We don't even know the frequency in which they talk to each other. I have some friends that think it's crazy that I talk to my father once a week. And, and a lot of some of my friends that live in a different state than their parents they're like, well, I don't speak to my parents, but every three months. So I could see, well, it's time to call the parents and, uh, and this conversation doesn't come up, you know? So it's, uh, because it, and what I mean by that is if, if he read that news report, went into the police department, the next time he talked to his son was three months later. Well, maybe it's not something you bring up. So here, here's some things that I wanted to figure out because this situation throws a big fat monkey wrench into the whole investigation. So if this guy, yeah, it either means one of two things, in my opinion, this story either makes him possibly the last, I well, as the story is today, he would then become the last identifiable witness to Simone being alive and well, or he's in the other category, the suspect category. My problem with the story is one, the details of what she was wearing and the duffel bag, which was never released. So that points to the direction of go, okay, well, this story is true, but my big problem is because this story is out and the story of Simone has already been out for a while. Why wouldn't this trooper come forward and go, yeah, I actually picked her up. I didn't know her name was Simone or I didn't remember her name was Simone. And I had her take a ride with this elderly man. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think part of the, Again, I think that goes back to the early complications of the case. She's not officially reported missing until nine days later. Did, did, did that trooper, did that story not reach him? Did, did he never see a be on the lookout for this missing person? Well, that's the one of the things that I think is the biggest problem. Like you said, there's four locations that we have to look into in this case, but the 
biggest this, thing this to makes me is, location number five potentially. Right, right, right. Five or six because you have the the rest stop plus where he dropped her off at is a different location. That's not where she'd get the ferry at, right? It, it from my understanding, it's not terribly far, and that that right. in lies a whole another set of questions that we haven't even got to yet. I, I think the big thing though is from her work to Cape Cod. That's seventy miles. That's the problem because we, we know, like in our town, in our city, Columbus, Ohio. You bring up Tyler Davis, most people know who you're talking about. Missing person from Easton. You bring up Brian Schaefer, all the medical student that went missing from a high state campus. You go about an hour away, they've never heard of the case. So I think that 70 mile distance between the restaurant and Cape Cod, that becomes a huge issue on why this case isn't solved. Well, so here's some other problems, right? This, the reports of of the clothing, I mean, I, he couldn't have made that up. I, yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that it's Simone, but the he, he couldn't have read the prior newspaper reports and gave this description Be, because, you, you know, this is not information that was publicly public knowledge at the time. In fact, he's the first one reporting that she's wearing something different. And you have to wonder, keep in mind, they've still not interviewed any of the waitresses at this time. This information after speaking to him does not go out to the public either. So when you interview these waitresses years and years later, and they're giving a different description of clothing than what was always reported. And now it matches what this old dude told you in 1986. Yeah. That one really causes some alarm bells to go off. But two, he wouldn't have got this information from anywhere else. Now, yeah. look, Sherborne police, they've done their due diligence on this. They went to the state police, to the state troopers, and they tried to t- track down any reports that would lead them to, th- they're trying to verify this story. Is this story truth or a lie? Because if he's, if he's lying, then why is he lying? Right. Is he just some senile old man? Some people do like to get involved in a case. Is he some weirdo that just wants to be in a case or is he injecting himself into the investigation because he has some kind of involvement in this disappearance? Just uh, put out some information that people might be wondering. Her social security has never been used and then there's been no activity on her bank account, no deposit, no withdrawal, no check writing. Yeah, that all stopped. Her social security number being used or the the bank account activity all stops 1977. So not been used since then. But the, the other curious parts of his story, he tells police that he picked, when he picked the girl up that he believed is Simone riding her, he picks her up September 3rd at about 6 or 6.30 in the morning. Well, We've, we have all these reports now that she had left work by 4 p.m. Right. We now have 14 hours unaccounted for. What, again, I, I am having a hard time figuring out the discrepancies between Friday evening and Saturday morning or arriving on Saturday. Uh, the son did confirm that his father was into clocks and did a lot of work on clocks. So that part of the story seems to be true. Sherborne police did their due diligence and even went beyond the scope of just the state troopers and thought, well, maybe it was a smaller agency, a more local agency to that area. And they checked and tried to find reports, nothing that they could find that back up this story from 1977. Doesn't mean that it wouldn't have happened. Doesn't mean that the state trooper didn't fill out a report. Doesn't mean that the state trooper ever had any awareness that a person that looked like this went missing. Yeah. And just this statement real quick, you know, I was watching true detective again, season one, a great show. And they're talking about what type of detective, you know, Russ is and what type of detective he is. And I would think if I, if I was a detective, I'd probably be old school, yellow legal pads. 
But nowadays, you have to take that those notes and then put them into the system. In, in 77, we didn't have a system like that. So how much information, how many leads have been lost throughout the years of detectives that looked into this case and kept their own notes and never put them into the system? Also, just like this, nowadays when cops are making traffic stops or troopers are making traffic stops, they're putting all this into a computer system right away. I mean, even once they're able to say, at this time, this officer looked up this person's license plate number. We don't have that information. And that's another frustrating thing about this case. I'm hoping that they were able to check like other Labor Day weekend years, maybe the year before, the year after. Could this old guy just have picked somebody else up? Right. And he is telling the truth, but it wasn't Simone. Uh, the thing that's interesting to me, though, and scary. Okay, so there's, <laughs> again, it's, it's the tightrope. The thing that's interesting to me that I think is fair, I believe that probably a 70-year-old man would would take, would recognize the ripped up and patched up jeans as maybe something unique especially if he's somebody that's not giving rides to persons often or maybe even ever. Maybe this is the only time he's ever done that. The other thing that's scary to me is if he's not an eye, an eyewitness and he falls into the other category is the, the recall of what she was wearing nine years later. Right. I was here in the garage studio with you seven days ago for Seems hours like yesterday for hour hours i could not tell you what you were wearing last week nothing when i saw I was, you i was wearing nothing well that would have stood out quite a bit the the general the the person's name is henry c and i'll spell his last name t-i-e-w-s so he like we said he has since passed away and well here's a here's a thing and not to interrupt you but we have these descriptions, and the problem is the loose descriptions of this jewelry. We weren't able to interview this eyewitness, quote unquote eyewitness, but we're able to talk to his son. It'd be interesting to talk to his son and go, You ever see any of these items? Because I could see some of the, like maybe these, uh, the, the spoon bracelets or this, uh, uh, silver necklace with some turquoise on it. I could see that being taken as a trophy. Well, the other problem that this air quotes witness pre presents is the suspects. So police have suspicions of what may have happened to Simone. And most of that all involves something very near where she worked and lived. If this guy's story is true and it was Simone that he drove for some distance that day, and if he dropped her off as he said he did, well, then that takes Simone out of the area. And now those suspicions don't hold water. So this, that, I, I feel like this guy, it, it, when we say throws a monkey wrench into this investigation, I think big time because you sit here and you go, okay, we're now tasked with some kind of problem. Yes, we can have our investigation and continue as we, as we are, but then we always have this little nagging thing over here about this guy who may have given her a ride that takes away from all of our, the other things that we found in our investigation, which are all things very close to where she lived and worked. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. 
If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Whether you're making the same breakfast that you have every day or baking a cake for an extra special day, eggs are a staple in our diets. Eggland's best eggs are nutritionally superior to ordinary eggs, containing more vitamins and 25% less saturated fat. Not only are they better for you, but Eggland's best eggs taste better too. There's a reason that they're America's number one eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com for additional information and delicious recipes. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome back. Cheers, mates. What do you say? Tall cans in the air? Power to the people. Tall cans in the air. Cheers to the people in the back. Cheers to you, Colonel. So if this case is going to stay at the local level, we talked about the old man taking the case further away from the local jurisdiction. But even well beyond that, We have some efforts that have been made, a good deal of efforts that have been made, and you can see this based off of the NamUs website, the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. So go to NamUs.com if you want to find some people that have been either unidentified or persons that are listed as missing. So on NamUs, what we learned from there, Captain, is that we have about 32 or so exclusions These are unidentified remains that were found in jurisdictions far and wide. Some even as far away as California or Florida or Ohio, where we are, and says, you know, hey, I got somebody that vaguely fits the description of your missing person. We need to do a little comparison here. And they've done comparisons and have about 32 or so exclusions in that regard. Well, and that's what's great is law enforcement has Simone's DNA so they can at least test it Unfortunately, any remains. Well, they've been using dental records to make these exclusions. So unfortunately, they don't have a full DNA profile for Simone. But that, I've been told, is in the works, that they're working to get that full DNA profile, and they hope and think that they will have that on file here soon, which that will be the most definitive way for one to make these exclusions going forward. Right. And so it's good though, to hear that these other jurisdictions are aware and are calling and making contact with the current investigators in Simone's case. As far as suspects go, well, we already talked about the elderly man. He, He can only fall into one of three categories, identifiable witness, suspect, or his story is true, but it's just a misidentification on his part. It wasn't Simone. He picked somebody else up either on that day or even at another date entirely. But there were 
there and still remain some other suspects in this case. Now, we want to focus in on potential relationships. So there was a relationship that Simone was having with an older man at the time of her disappearance. This man has been looked at and actually was cleared very early on in this investigation. And he's cleared because, well, frankly, it would be impossible for him to have direct involvement in her disappearance as he was locked up at the time. Right. And this is interesting, too, because Simone would go and visit him at the corrections facility. Again, from my understanding, the limited information I know or been told about this relationship is that it was kind of an on again, off again relationship. I don't know this individual's name. I do know that he was older than Simone. But one thing that I do know for certain is that when she would go to visit him, this is stuff that had to be prearranged. You would have to make arrangements well in advance to be granted access to see one another to have this interaction and the reports are that she was had made arrangements to visit him on the 17th of September. She's last seen at work on the 2nd of September. The elderly man says he picks her up, gave her a ride on the 3rd of September. We know mom believed that she was going to arrive by the 3rd of September. Never did. She's reported missing on the 11th. Now we're all the way out to the 17th of September, 1977. The police, who are now looking for Simone, catch wind of this arranged appointment to go see this man at the correction facility. Right. One, they're going to want to talk to him anyway. But two, they, they really just want to find Simone. And th I think everybody's working and should be working under the premise that she's probably alive and just out doing her thing, or, or maybe she ran off somewhere, whatever. This is still early on in the investigation. They go to the correction facility on that day, on the day that the, we have the appointment arranged for, hoping to see Simone there. They don't see Simone there, obviously. They interview this guy there. That's when they get the records. They do all their checking and find out that, nope, on the second and the third, he was still where he is today in this corrections facility. So we have the elderly man, quote unquote, eyewitness that gave her a ride. We have the boyfriend, but he's locked up. Do we have other suspects in this case? We do. So there is a person that is regarded as a creepy regular at the restaurant. He is somebody that police are interested in. He's right. not going to be the only person that they're interested in. He, This was a restaurant that was frequented by a lot of the locals there, and they stayed pretty busy. But there's some information from other persons that work there that have created an interest in this individual. I don't know much about this individual, but what we do know about another individual is there is a man named Daniel Newbert. Old so, Newbert. And I, I'm going to steal two paragraphs directly from a news article that says, another question is a reference to a Daniel Newbert. Newbert sent the family, Simone's family, pictures of Simone around the time of her disappearance. What's really interesting about these photos for a couple, for a multitude of reasons, Captain, but first is some of these photos were ones that were used in many of the missing persons flyers early on. And in fact, I believe that a couple of these photos are still being used to this day, maybe even in the, the VICAP alert report that we get from the FBI. So these pictures were used on many of the missing person flyers. The article goes on to state police talked to Newbert, who said he once gave riding her a ride and asked if he could take photos of her. Daniel Newbert gave the negatives to the police. They also investigated another man who was allegedly into the quote drug scene and quote and trying to court Simone Rittinger. So there's two individuals right there that are still of interest to investigators in this case. And these, both of these individuals would be local. They would be townies. They would be local. I don't know if 
the creepy restaurant patron is one of these guys that we just discussed. You know, do we have three guys of interest or two? That part to me is unclear. Now, one thing that is of interest too is a similar case that took place. I believe this, yes, this was 1985. So Simone goes missing in 1977. The old man comes forward in 1986 after he reads a newspaper article the day before. But when the, all of this is going on in the middle of all this, we have this case from 1985. And this is from Channel 22 News, WWLP.com. Working for you for 70 years is what they tell us. Uh, thank you for working for us. Yeah. Uh, WWLP. But so their Keeping article. the tunes are flowing. Steve Nielsen uh, wrote this article and the, the title is Detective Seeking Closure for Family of Woman Killed in 1985. And it reads, Janine Callahan was following her morning routine. The 24-year-old left her Natick, Massachusetts home to walk to work at the now closed Zare store. I don't know what a Zare store is. She never made it to work. That's the key here. And this was November 9th, 1985. And they said that a month later, her remains were found at the end of a dirt road, now known as Cherry Farm. Quote, she was naked with nothing but a pair of gym socks on. End quote. She was covered with a discarded Christmas tree. The medical examiner was unable to determine the cause of death. There was too much trauma to the body. The investigation has been ongoing now for all of these years. They believe this investigator that's quoted a couple times in this article says that he believes that the perpetrator would have likely lived near this cherry farm road where she was eventually found uh, to generate new leads in the case. The investigation, uh, added her to a deck of playing cards. We've seen that in several states over the years. And they're just hoping to interview some people and get some more information in this case. And this detective is saying that they believe that it's still a solvable case. Her case has been linked. We're not saying it's absolutely connected to Simone Reidinger's case. The detectives aren't saying that either. They're just saying simply, look, the two worked so this individual, Callahan, Janine Callahan, she lived and worked in Natick. Simone worked in Natick and lived nearby in Framingham. The weird thing about their lives is up to the time that they disappear, they're both doing similar things in their lives. So they both moved into new apartments relatively short period before they went missing. Right. Again, Simone in Framingham and Janine in Natick, but not far from one another. Regardless if these cases are connected at all, what we need here is both of these cases to get solved. So anyone with any information that can help police in Janine Callahan's murder investigation or any other cold cases for that fact in the state is asked to call one eight seven seven R I solve. And so these cases are linked simply by the Natick, Massachusetts location. Well, like I said yesterday, because I'm a Guinness, not a genius, a Guinness. I think uh, this is a really good strategy as far as cold cases are concerned. Come out and say, this is the information that we have. This is what we know for certain. And here's the questions that we have as far as law enforcement goes, because I think that would really start sparking people's interest. And also, like I think with so many online sleuthers, when you hear these questions, I think some of these sleuthers would go, maybe I can find that answer to this question. And so one of the questions that then becomes, what hasn't law enforcement done? What paths could we possibly take in this case to solve it, to get some resolve? Yeah, the thing here is these are only leads that are not followed up on. 
for the most part because they're not leads. That's not, not information that ever made its way to law enforcement. So that's why they're telling you, this is what we know. This is what we would like to know in Simone's case. We need some leads. Give us some information that's going to give us a new lead to follow up on. And that's why I think it's so incredible and important that people keep their earballs completely open when we say that the Sherborne Police Department is saying they're not asking for information in her disappearance. They're not asking for information in her murder. They're not simply asking for information about a potential suspect. They are asking for any and all information regarding Simone. Right. We need to learn more about her life. We need to learn more about what she was up to. And that's why I circle around this apartment idea. That was the newest thing in her life at that time. That's a big moment in one's life to move out of mom and dad's house and get their own apartment. And she was only there for about two months or so prior to her disappearance. What happened that night? What happened September 2nd to September 3rd? Why do we have that discrepancy in this timeline of making her way out to visit mom and chill with mom for a long weekend at the cottage? The other thing, too, is as the story always goes, Simone was 17 when she was last seen on September 2nd, 1977, leaving from the former Rainbow Restaurant in Natick, Massachusetts after her shift. She planned to hitchhike to Cape Cod to catch a ferry to Martha's Vineyard to meet up with her parents. Okay. What ferry? There's multiple ferries that run out of there. And all of the old newspaper reports, they reference Woods Hole, that that would be where she was going to go to pick up the ferry to get to her final destination which we've always been told that the final destination was Chappaquitta and the Chappaquitta area is where the cottage is located. Okay. There's two ferries that run out of woods hole. So that's a certainly a possibility, right? The problem is that that is not, neither of those ferries get her the closest to Chappaquitta. There's another ferry that runs out of a completely different area that would get her much closer to her final destination. So why isn't that location ever referenced as where she was headed? There's just a lot missing from this story. There's a lot of information that's missing from this case. And that is why police are asking anyone with any information at all to get involved. If you knew that she hated gym class, give them a call. Right. If you believe that you lived in that apartment building with her for any period of time, give them a call. Yeah. Did you know about, did you work with her? Or were you friends with her and knew that she had a crush on somebody? Give them a call. And as far as I'm concerned, the way that this case gets solved, first off, you have the obvious. If we can find her remains, right. that's going to set up a whole different set of circumstances for this investigation. There will be evidence, other evidence that will come along with that finding that will generate new leads for the investigators in this case. The other thing too, is I keep going back to this apartment, man. I can't shake it that police seem to know damn near nothing about this apartment. Other than the address is 229 Linden Street, Framingham. That's the address that I was given. Is there any solid paperwork or anything that backs up that that was the actual apartment? Was was, was there a, was she in apartment A or B or, or 101? Was there an apartment number that's supposed to accompany this address? The thing, the reason why I keep going back to that, Captain, is a couple of things. Because you're nuts. A rent was due at some point. Uh huh. And when rent wasn't collected, who do we call? We know mom helped her find the apartment. When she goes missing, did anybody ever go to the apartment and collect all of her belongings? 
she goes missing. We're we're told time and time again she's last seen September 2nd. Did she pay September's rent before leaving? When was that due? Was it first month, last month situation? Anytime there's money involved, there's usually some kind of trail, some kind of paper trail. Here, there seems to be no trail. The trails, the trail is non-existent. There should be some more information regarding this apartment. And I cannot help but believe that because there's so many questions that start at ground zero, which is her apartment and her work, that this has got to be something very local, very local here. And here we are in the garage with yet another case, just hoping and praying that with some information that we've been able to throw out and a lot of speculation that we've been able to throw out, that it generates more interest in this case and could potentially generate some tips. Again, if you know anything at all in this case, if you know anything at all about Simone Reidinger, please We encourage everybody with information to call the Sherbourne Police Department. Their phone number is 508-653-2424, and we will include that phone number in today's show notes. I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage and sharing these cases on social media. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? This week, Captain, we are recommending Catch the Sparrow, a search for a sister in the truth of her murder by Rachel Rear. Catch the Sparrow is the gripping story of a young woman's murder unsolved for over two decades, brilliantly investigated and reconstructed by her stepsister. Growing up, Rachel Rear knew the story of Stephanie Kopchetsky's disappearance. The beautiful violinist and teacher had fled an abusive relationship on Martha's Vineyard and made a new start for herself near Rochester, New York. And then one morning, she was gone. Check out Catch the Sparrow. You can find that great title and many more other recommendations on our recommended page on our website, truecrimegarage.com. Join us back here in the garage next week. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.